confidence interval interpretation. How should we think about confidence intervals and how should we interpret them? I'll mention four approaches. Uh, the first is the definitional one. Everyone agrees this is the correct way to do it, always correct. And that is that our confidence interval is a randomly chosen one from a whole sequence, a whole dance. And so whenever we see a single interval, we should bring to mind that behind it, there's a whole dance, even though we don't know what that uh, dance is. Now, for the real um, everyday practical researcher, we don't know the population and we don't have a whole dance. So we can turn off the population. Uh, we don't know the uh, mean of the population and we don't have a whole sequence of intervals, we have only a single one. So that's our situation. And we need to imagine that behind this is a population and a dance, and that our confidence interval might be red. We might have been unlucky, and we might have a red confidence interval. Unfortunately, in real life, confidence intervals don't come coloured. We can't look at our interval and see whether it's red, see whether it is actually missing the population parameter. The second and third and fourth ways all interpret our single interval rather than the whole sequence, the whole dance. Now is that reasonable? Well, yes, I believe it is, provided that our interval is reasonably representative of the whole dance. And there's one primary situation where it isn't, and we saw that uh, a little while back, and that's when the sample is extremely small, say four, and then if I run a dance there, the extent of variability of confidence interval length is just enormous. So if we just have one of these, we might have happened to get a very long one or a very short one, and either way, it's quite uncertain what our precision is. The sample standard deviation S is not a good estimate of the population standard deviation sigma, which we like to know but don't. And so a confidence interval uh, when N is very small, extremely small, is not terribly much use. So in that case, I'd really hesitate about interpreting our single interval. But in just about every other case, I think it's perfectly reasonable to consider our interval. In fact, we don't really have any option. We have just a single one, and it's this one we need to interpret. So the second approach is to consider the cat's eye on our interval. Bring to mind the cat's eye picture, and to interpret it as telling us that most likely the true value is round about the center, the point estimate but that values out towards the end, the limits, and even a whisker beyond, are plausible also, decreasingly so. And there's still a little bit of plausibility beyond the ends of the confidence interval. This is probably the most widely applicable, the most useful way to think about a confidence interval. We could summarize it as interpret our interval. Think about what the point estimate means, think about what the lower limit and the upper limit mean, and so give practical interpretation in the research context of this whole interval with an emphasis on the centre sort of half of the interval. The third approach is to consider the margin of error of our interval and think of that as the maximum likely error of estimation. Most likely, in 95% of cases, the true population parameter we're trying to estimate will be within MOE of our sample mean. And the uh, fourth approach is a question of prediction. Very early on in chapter one, we talked about, well, if this was our result of the poll, then if we repeated the poll, what are we likely to get? And the answer is most likely, not guaranteed, but most likely another mean in this interval. Now we can look at this by running a dance here and marking those cases where the following mean does not fall within the confidence interval. So here we have our first confidence interval and the uh, next mean actually fell outside that first interval. 
the second one, well, the third mean fell inside the interval just before it. Here's a case where if this was our single interval and uh, we then did the experiment again and we got this result, well, this mean just falls a tiny bit outside this interval. And if we run this sequence and count up the proportion that have pink lines, we'll find that in the long run, about um, 16, 17% of cases, we have pink lines. So there's about a 83, 84% chance, about five chances out of six, that the next mean will fall within the first confidence interval that we get. In other words, this confidence interval, this 95% confidence interval, is about an 83% prediction interval for where the next mean will fall. Why not 95? Well, the short story is that there's sampling variability, sampling error in both this and that. Uh, try it out here and just count up and monitor the percentage uh, capture there of the following one. But the take home message is that one way, one useful way to think about a confidence interval is that it tells us where most likely the result of a close replication will fall. There's about a five in six chance that the mean of a close replication will fall within the 95% confidence interval that we got in the first experiment. And this means that confidence intervals are very closely linked to prediction and to replication. And that's, of course, right at the heart of open science. So it's an important way to think about confidence intervals.